If you stand on one foot while holding a glass of lemon water, while putting apple cider vinegar in your ear, of course while being fasted, while standing on a treadmill backwards, you're going to get all these benefits. Okay. Sometimes that's what it feels like. And I understand that even the content on this very channel gives you a lot of little bricks that ultimately go into the wall of weight loss, longevity, just overall lifestyle. But we cannot forget what I would consider the holy grail. Okay, the holy grail is simple. When all else fails, caloric restriction works. This does not mean that I'm turning my back on the fasting world, because fasting still obviously has elements of caloric restriction. My point is that if you ever get tired of stacking all these different bricks in the wall, I don't get tired of it because I love the complexity of it. I love these little pieces. Remember that caloric restriction is very important. So this video is going to highlight the benefits of simple caloric restriction when you just don't have the mental capacity to worry about the other things. Bottom line is we don't need as much food as we think we can live in a deficit much easier than people think. Okay, So we think food is fuel, so we need to constantly fuel ourselves, and that's how we stay alive. No, it's a delicate balance of giving us enough fuel, but also periodically restricting so we get stronger and more resilient and also preserve ourselves, if that's how you really want to put it. The first thing I want to address is mitochondrial function. It's a great place to start and how caloric restriction affects mitochondrial function. If the mitochondria are the factories that produce energy, we want more factories, right? And if we start losing factories, we don't have cellular function. And if we start losing, or the factories start getting dirty, they don't produce energy, and we start having exhaust and dysfunction. If the roads leading to and out of the mitochondria are broken down and the bridges are out, then we don't get the fuel, we get a backup, and we end up with all kinds of problems. So that leads me to an interesting study that was published in the journal PLOS1. Very fascinating because it looked at a control diet, okay, that was regular maintenance, compared to a 25% calorie restriction diet, compared to a 25% calorie restriction plus exercise diet. That diet did 12.5% calorie restriction from their nutrition and 12.5% caloric restriction through exercise. So one group just reduced calories 25%, the other group reduced calories 12.5%, but exercised another 12.5% to equal 25%. Well, what they were looking at is the genes that were expressed. The caloric restriction groups, both of them, they had heightened expression of genes that were associated with mitochondrial function. PPAR, uh, CERT1, ultimately PGC1A, things like that downstream of that. What this means is that, okay, being in a deficit increased the expression of genes that made the mitochondria stronger. Not a huge surprise, but it really is the goal that we're after, so that's good news. But what's really interesting is they saw an increase in what is called mitochondrial DNA, mDNA. Our mitochondria have their own DNA, and when we have higher levels of mDNA, it means we have more mitochondria, which is a good thing. Well, in this case, they saw a 35% increase in mitochondrial DNA in the calorie restriction group, and they saw a 21% increase in mitochondrial DNA in the calorie restriction plus exercise group. Kind of wild, right? You would think that the exercise group would actually see more, but believe it or not, what this told us is that restricting nutrients was actually more important for longevity than an exercise-induced deficit. Now. Don't take that totally out of context because think about it. If you exercise a lot, you build muscle. Muscle is going to be good for longevity. If you exercise a lot, you can have better cardiovascular health. So when you, when you factor in all these other pieces that you have to look at, cardiovascular disease risk, obesity, insulin resistance, exercise definitely plays a role. But when you're simply looking on paper at gene expression and how it affects longevity, simple nutrient deprivation seems to be the king. So that doesn't mean don't exercise, you absolutely should exercise, but it's very, very interesting. Now this study was done with younger people. In order to really get an adequate picture painted, we have to look at older people, right? 
Unfortunately, we have to go to a rodent model for this because we need to look at lifelong caloric restriction. And that's very hard to put a person in a metabolic ward for their entire life. So this study was published in the journal Cell Metabolism. It did look at just that. It looked at mice with lifelong caloric restriction. What they found is that the mice that were living with caloric restriction throughout their life ended up preventing the age-related loss of mitochondrial oxidative capacity. That means as we get older, our mitochondria lose the ability to deal with fuel and create energy. Well, these mice that were going through caloric restriction for the lion's share of their life, they did not lose that ability. Their mitochondria stayed strong. Now let's weave into the inflammation piece, which is a very important piece, and as well as the gut, right? I will go ahead and make a very important mention that when you are looking at caloric restriction, there are a lot of different things that you can do to restrict calories. Increasing fiber, increasing protein, increasing fluid intake, all these things are going to ultimately allow you to reduce calories because they're A, increasing the satiety, but they can also increase a thermic effect by having more protein, things like that. I put a link down below for Thrive Market. If you are doing any kind of eating pattern, I don't care if you are vegan, if you are paleo, if you are keto, if you are AIP, it does not matter. Eating in a deficit can still give you these benefits that we're talking about. So Thrive Market's an online membership-based grocery store. That link gets you 25% off your entire grocery order. That means everything you put in your shopping cart, you're gonna save 25% off that grocery order. Plus, you get a free gift. And this is only if you're using my link down below in the description. Okay, I've been working with Thrive Market on this channel for five years, touting them in all kinds of videos. They're a huge sponsor. So that link down below saves you 25%. Plus, the best part, you order up your groceries, you can sort by diet type, figure out what works for you, and then it gets delivered to your doorstep within two, three days. So A, you get everything that you could ever want and you can search for it and you can sort by diet type. B, you don't have to waste your time going to the grocery store, running into people you don't wanna run into. And C, it ends up at your doorstep, all packaged up, all in a really good way that you can just rock and roll, put it in your pantry, or even put their sustainable meat and seafood options directly in your freezer. Okay, so check them out down below in the description. So when we look at the gut and inflammation, it sounds like overhyped marketing hubba blue, right? It's kind of annoying. But there was a study that was published in the journal Scientific Reports that took a look at 20 obese women. It was fascinating. They put them on a very low calorie diet for four weeks, okay? Pretty simple. What they found in relation with inflammation in the gut was pretty phenomenal. They found that caloric restriction reduced C-reactive protein, inflammation, no surprise, reduced high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is associated with cardiovascular disease and all kinds of things, really no surprise there. They also saw a decrease in what is called lipopolysaccharide binding protein. Lipopolysaccharides are what leak out of our gut into our bloodstream and cause all kinds of issues, okay? So the binding protein actually prevents that from happening. So with this, believe it or not, they saw a decrease in gut permeability, okay? So just by putting them on a diet, a caloric restricted diet, they saw a decrease in gut permeability. This is so important because it helps conduct immune signaling. It helps the body absorb nutrients properly. Gut permeability, leaky gut isn't just, well, it is overhyped marketed stuff, but it is still a real thing. And this is an interesting way. Who would have ever thought caloric restriction improves gut permeability? But one of the things that we really have to pay attention to, especially as we get older, is we don't want to suppress our immune system. But on the same toke, we do want to make sure that we are modulating inflammation because we have what is called damage-associated molecular patterns. As we get older, cells become damaged, mitochondria become damaged. So we end up with fragments of DNA from these mitochondria and things like that, that the body has to send the immune system to deal with. So it results in a low-grade chronic inflammation that seems to be correlated with age. This is a problem and might explain a lot of pain and issues that people deal with as they age. But what we don't want to do is crush the immune system so much, especially in an aging person, that we don't have an immune system to function properly. Well, that's where this other study comes in. This study was published in the journal Aging and took 218 subjects. It was a two-year-long study that looked at ad libitum, eating as much as you want, or 25%, a modest 25% caloric restriction. Okay, what they found is that, yes, there was no surprise a decrease in inflammation a 40% decrease in C-reactive protein, and a respective 50% decrease in the inflammatory cytokine, tumor necrosis factor alpha. 
tremendous things, but that big of a drop in inflammation and inflammatory cytokines would have alarms going off in my head saying, is their immune system suppressed? We want to crush inflammation, but we don't want to crush the immune system. Well, what they found is that their responsiveness, antibody responsiveness to both vaccines and infection did not change. They still had good antibody response. So what this means is that we crushed inflammation in this. They crushed inflammation, but did not impair their immune system. This is exactly the recipe we look for with aging. And caloric restriction seems to play a huge role with that. Very important stuff to know. Then we move into something called autophagy, which I'm guilty of touting a lot, right? I talk about autophagy all the time and why fasting can be so powerful when it comes down to autophagy. But we have to remember that autophagy is not only associated with fasting. The fasting world didn't just claim autophagy and own it, caloric restriction just induces autophagy. The question has always remained, is it a light switch or is it a dimmer switch? Does more caloric restriction equal more autophagy? It might, let's find out. There was a study that was published in the journal Aging. Now, this study was done in mice, okay, but it's still mechanistic and it's pretty interesting and we can extrapolate some data from it and combine it with other studies to try to figure stuff out. So what they did is they put mice on either a 12 and 24 hour ad libitum diet, eat as much as you want, or anywhere from a zero to 40% caloric restriction diet. So it ranged from zero to 40% because they wanted to see a scale of caloric restriction. Well, they found that, of course, caloric restriction induced autophagy. Autophagy, again, being the cellular recycling. So cellular recycling where as our cells get older and they get used more, there's components of cells that become decrepit and not very good. So autophagy recycles those to fuel the cell. It prevents toxic things from building up in a cell that would normally lead to apoptosis and a cell ultimately having to self-destruct or you know, purposely die off. So autophagy is a very good thing and it declines with age. So as we get older, we don't want our autophagy to go down. We don't want our cells to just become dirty. We want our cells to become squeaky clean. So they found that caloric restriction increased the expression of eight different genes associated with autophagy. Okay, so the more genes that expressed, the more autophagy occurred. The interesting thing is, it was, for lack of a better term, dose dependent based upon caloric restriction level. The more caloric restriction there was, the more extreme, the more autophagic genes were expressed. This is huge news. Unfortunately, it's in mice, so we can't say with certainty that it's in humans, but looking at a lot of the autophagy research in rodents, a lot of times it does parallel in humans, but more research needs to be done, but this is fascinating news. So if we do look at a human study though, there was a study that was published in Cell Reports that took a look at a range from three to 15 years of caloric restriction in humans. What they did find is that caloric restriction did increase what is called GRP78, and also heat shock protein 70, HSP70. What these are, are they're called chaperoning molecules. So what they do is they basically take proteins and they make sure they go to the right place and fold in the right place. If these chaperoning proteins are low, you run a risk of, as we get older, these proteins not folding properly to build cells and components of cells. And it's called misguided proteins. They need to, they need to be properly put into places where they need to go, right? So when you have more of these chaperoning proteins, you have better formation of proteins. This is a good thing with aging, but they also found there was an increase in BCLEAN1 and LC3, which are autophagy-related genes. So they had more expression of these autophagy-related genes in humans. So the more the caloric rec uh, restriction, the more there was overall autophagy-related genes. This is a huge thing. Again, it tells us it's not just about fasting, but more caloric restriction might be better. Maybe fasting is extreme caloric restriction, but where do you draw the line and where do you actually draw a time frame for that caloric restriction? The last overarching thing we need to talk about is AMPK as a master regulator. And the reason that AMPK is so important is because AMPK is the energy sensor within our body. And when our body is demanding more energy than what we have available. Like when our energy demand, because maybe we're running, is greater than what, our, what we have available, that phosphorylates AMPK. Okay, it's all about an ATP AMP ratio, which we don't need to go into biochemistry too much, but basically it is this master switch. And when AMPK is phosphorylated, we have all kinds of cool things that happen. In this case, we have mitochondrial signaling that occurs. You're in a deficit, so the mitochondria says, I have to get stronger in order to create energy. 
all the stuff we talked about with the mitochondria, good news. We have an improvement in the mTOR signal getting disrupted, right? So mTOR is pro-growth. It's like the opposite of AMPK. When mTOR is activated, we're growing. That can also mean growing not so good things, tumors, et cetera, right? But you can't live without mTOR, you need it. But it allows for this proper balance. So AMPK inhibits mTOR. Okay, now AMPK also inhibits mTOR, which would normally stand in the way of autophagy. Autophagy simply does not occur when mTOR is present globally. mTOR can be present at a localized level within a muscular, muscular system, whatever, but when it's activated globally, mTOR1C, autophagy simply can't occur. So AMPK inhibits mTOR, so autophagy can occur. Once we have this happening, we have all kinds of other things, sirtuins that can be expressed, which activate different longevity components. We have FOXO3, which is a transcription factor, which allows us to become more resilient. For example, cold exposure, things like that. FOXO3 is going to allow us to be more resilient, harder to essentially kill, right? So all these things come together. And of course, we could go on and on and on. So is fasting better than caloric restriction? Maybe for different things, but maybe caloric restriction is better for different things. But we're all after the same darn thing. So as always, keep it locked in here by channel. I'll see you tomorrow.